Yes, good morning and welcome everybody to the second part of this, uh, of earthquakes and tectonics. We have four sessions. This is the second one. We have another, um, another exciting five talks in this part. And you know the trick how to post questions. Uh, my name is Johnny Jonsson and my co chair is Cecile Lasser. And we hope to run this smoothly. And I warn the speakers about two minutes before the time is up that um, you have to finish up. So with that, I, I think uh, we should not wait dive in and immediately dive into the presentation. So the first one is going to be given by John uh, Dianala on uh, using INSAR to constrain the seismogenic potential of the Philippine fault creeping sections and geothermal subsidence, subsidence on the late uh, island. So go ahead, John. And unmute yourself. Hello, sorry about that. Hello, everyone. So, my name is JD Jana, and I'll be presenting findings from our study on the Philippine Fault, particularly on how we use INSAR to constrain the seismogenic potential of the so called creeping section on Leyte Island. As well as the geothermal subsidence that occurs near the fault. And then this work is part of my PhD studies at the University of Oxford, recently finished, supported by the Newton Fund, through the British Council, and the Philippine government. Now, many geodetic studies and faults show the generally complementary distribution of earthquake rupturing and creeping sections of faults. Now, physically, this makes sense as the slow as creep. The slow gradual slip on faults prevents the accumulation of stress. Now, if a fault is locked, the sketch on the bottom right shows an idealized model of the earthquake cycle of inter seismic accumulation of the, that stress and release of the stress that results to earthquakes. Hence, an important part of understanding the seismogenic potential of a fault is constraining the extent of locking and creep in the inter seismic which is shown by the diagram on the bottom left. And this allows us to estimate the potential size and recurrence of earthquakes. The challenge is that slow slip is in the range of a few millimeters to centimeters per year of displacement, and this is not so easy to measure. But of course, thanks to advances in INSAR in the past few decades, uh, pole behavior in onshore settings can be studied in more detail than before. And this is what we have done for the Philippine Fault, as I will share in this presentation. Now, the Philippine Fault is a 1,200 kilometer long left lateral strike slip fault. As shown on the map to the left, this fault traverses the Philippines' largest islands from Mindanao in the south, all the way to Luzon in the north, where Manila is. Now, this fault formed as a consequence of the strain partitioning between the caused by the, is, caused, is formed from the strain partitioning caused by the oblique convergence between the Philippine Sea Plate in the east and Eurasia. The yellow circles there represent the location of known surface structuring earthquakes on the Philippine Fault Zone, including the magnitude 7.7 .7 Luzon earthquake in 1990. As shown in the picture on the right, this earthquake involved left lateral offsets of up to six meters on the ground and shown by the displaced uh, rice paddies. Now, in this white box over here is the island of Leyte, where the known creeping section is found. A good example of that is this picture on the bottom right, where you see a house that is actually sitting on top of a fault. And the door frame, outlined in yellow, is already deformed and still getting deformed aseismically due to the lateral fault slip at the, or near the surface of the earth. Now, on later, the main fault divides the island lengthwise from north to south, as you can see in the map in the middle, and cuts through quaternary volcanoes. Fault creep was first quantified with campaign GPS surveys in the 1990s with the velocity vectors, also in the map, relative to a local reference station. As the fault creeps fast of around, at around 2.5 to 3.5 centimeters per year, uh, similar to the long-term SIP rates, most believe that the fault is gener generally aseismic. However, a significant magnitude 6.5 earthquake happened there in July 2017, 
the bottom left is an image of the earthquake, a six-day six day Sentinel-1 interferogram of the earthquake. And the bottom right are display structures in Tonganan, as documented by FIVOX. And the yellow line outlines the displacement of the fence of up to 1.1 meters uh, bilaterally. So when this earthquake happened, everyone was quite surprised and naturally had the question, what exactly is happening on this fault? So to answer that question, we measured the interseismic displacements with four years of ALUS data. The map on the left shows the ALUS ascending track line of sight velocity map from time series analysis, while the map in the middle shows the deformation from stacking descending track in the pyrograms. Now, with a much better data coherence in the ascending data, where we have lesser gray areas within the velocity field, we can see the sharp gradient on different parts of the fault. Uh, with the fault being the black line. And you can also see this looking at line of sight velocity profiles across the fault. Here on the right, I only show the three northernmost profiles, P0 to P2, and the three southernmost profiles, P6 to P8. And from these, uh, you can see that the magnitude of the velocity step is not constant everywhere. From the north in P0, the velocity step starts to diminish on profile P2. In the southern part of the island, from PA to the south, uh, the fault is already perpendicular to the line of sight of the ascending track. So any fault parallel slip is unlikely to be resolved by the uh, INSAR data. Another important deformation signal is this blue elliptical area of subsidence just south of P2. And this is related to a geothermal power plant near the fault and also known from leveling surveys. Now, with the leveling data, we can model the subsidence source, uh, which is previously unknown, independent of the INSAR data. And we find that a deflating rectangular source, or uh, elastic sill, captures the signal quite well, shown in the figures on the bottom, with the data and the prediction from the uh, best fitting model. And here on profile S, S prime, the vertical velocity from INSAR, the fuzzy gray dots. It's also similar to the observation and the model predictions from leveling, the blue and the red lines, respectively. Further, we find that the sill source model is at the bottom of the geothermal wells. And we think that this suggests that the model may be capturing the depth of the compacting source from fluid extraction. And for these reasons, the subsidence source is useful for us in for doing a joint inversion for fault slip and subsidence. Now, to model SIP on the fault from the INSAR data, we follow the Bayesian approach. Now, this turns the linear problem D equals to GM, with M, our unknowns, are the model parameters, into an exploration of the solution space that gives a distribution of the probable models given the data, or defined by a posterior probability density function, or PDF, based on the model probability from a priori knowledge of the fault kinematics, like the fault being a left lateral strike-slip fault, defined by, a prior PD, by our prior PDFs, which, which you can assign, and the fit of the model predictions and weighted by the data covariance. Now, what's fixed are the geometries of the subsidence source, which we previously determined, and the discretized vertical fault, as shown on the right, with smaller patches towards the surface. And here we also assume the homogeneous elastic half space for the Green's function. From our INSAR velocity maps, here is the resulting interseismic slip model on the bottom left. This highlights the variability of the slip rate on the fault, a long strike from the north to the south, and also down dip from the surface up to 15 kilometers depth. Now the darker colors indicate faster slip. The SIP rates on the patches near the surface are quite fast at several centimeters per year. And it's quite similar to the deep SIP rate, or which is a proxy for the circular rate or the long-term SIP rate of the fault at around three centimeters per year. These numbers here are just some of the previous estimates of the long-term SIP rate of the Philippine fault from sparse data in, uh, used by PV studies. Now, most well, what's most interesting, I think, for most is the, that this model shows this significant part of the fault in the middle has slip deficit in the light colored patches where the 20, 2017 earthquake also happened. And this is what we call the Tomanan segment. 
we modeled the co-seismic slip in a similar way as the interseismic model, and our results show that the Tonganan segment did indeed rupture in 2017. For this model, we used ALICE 2 data and data also from the Sentinel-1 satellites. This graph here on the left shows the uh, along strike distribution of the slip on the surface, or at least on the shallowest patches, the red line. And this black dot here is the displacement measured from uh, the field, uh, particularly the displaced fence. Now, we were also able to determine the slip from a magnitude 5.8 aftershock four days after the main shock, thanks to an, inter an emergency Sentinel-1 acquisition. Uh, just a day after the main shock. Now, interestingly, what we find in this aftershock SIP model is that most the SIP is mostly at depth, and the aftershock involved rupture just past this fault bend south of the main shock. Now, what's helpful with these models is that we can analyze the SIP budget from the posterior distributions of our interseismic and our co-seismic SIP knowing that we have assumed the same fault geometry and elasticity parameters. And this eliminates some of the ambiguity involved when we just simply, simply take published seismic common calculations. And so estimating that return time of your earthquakes from just the main shock, the blue PDF, versus adding in the aftershock slip, the orange PDF, gives slightly different ranges within 95% probability. The main shock PDF, main shock only PDF gives us a range of 16 to 63 years while the main shock plus aftershock PDF gives us 22 to 79 years. Now, what I think these estimates are interesting because um, work done by Yo Fukushima suggests that a magnitude 6.9 earthquake in Leyte in June 1947 has very similar seismograms as the 20, 2017 event. This here is just one example from measurements in Berkeley in California, essentially, with the black line showing the seismograms of the 1947 event and the, 20, the red line showing the seismogram from the 2017 event. As far as I know, we've not had any similar magnitude earthquakes between 2017 and 1947. Going back further in time, an earthquake in 1890 is set up an epicenter in Leyte, at least based on some intensity reports. Now with the geodetic, geodetic constraints that we now have, I think we need to take a good look again at these historical records if indeed we can uh, rely on these. For the earthquake physics community, modeling the variability of the fault behavior leads to many interesting questions on the fault mechanics. I cannot go into a lot of detail in the interest of time, but there appears to be several factors that appear to be press that are present in later that could be promoting a seismic slip, uh, promoting a seismic slip on the later fault. Particularly, we have the, the presence of active hydrothermal systems right on the fault, where we have the volcanoes, or the fault cutting across volcanoes. We also have evidence of the presence of some minerals which are believed to be rate strengthening. Uh, and we also have a pretty shallow ultramafic basement, which also appears to be serpentinized in different locations. Now, if you take a look at the, the graph on the bottom left, shows the variability of the creep rate in blue and the co-seismic slip in red. And we can see here, the question to me now becomes, why then is the fault locked in the middle? despite these different factors. So earlier I mentioned the co coincidence of the earthquake with the fault bend. So perhaps the geometric complexity is a clue on some complex dynamics or maybe some uh, heterogeneous lithology in down dip, down dip in the fault. Um, we are yet to really find out, but for now the insert data has highlighted, help us highlight the seismogenic potential of the so-called creeping section in Leyte. We have this fault the section, this tone and segment, which is locked and capable of 96.5 earthquakes. And our historical record suggests that you might expect a uh, uh, recur recurrence of around several decades. And the INSAR also helps us constrain the subsidence uh, in near the fault. And of course, the actual deformation cycle of faults is a lot more complex, and we will need to put in a lot more effort in continuous monitoring of the fault with the help of upcoming INSAR technologies. And I end your presentation there. If you have questions, I can entertain them later, or you can also check out our paper, which is published uh, just late last year. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, uh, for that very interesting story from the Philippines and uh, excellent results.
like with the other sessions, we will wait with the questions until the end uh, to the dedicated questions and answers session. So we'll go and move straight to the second talk, which is going to be given by Tim Wright on the high resolution tectonic strain map for the Alpine Himalayan belt from Sentinel-1. So go ahead, Thanks. Tim. Thanks, Johnny. I'm just uh, waiting for the permission to share my screen. Yeah, I guess you have some uh, figures to show, right? Yeah, just a few. Yeah. It's hard to there describe the strain yeah. map in words. So. Okay, how's that? Looks good. Okay, great. Okay, so um, good morning, evening, depending on where you are in the world. And um, what I want to present to you really is the work of a, a kind of huge amount of effort from the team um, within Comet and the LIX project over many years. And this has in, involved a large number of people, not all of them, but all of these people in red have been involved at some point in this work that I'm presenting today. In particular, I want to acknowledge Yasser Maksudi, uh, Milan Lezeki, um, who've done a lot of the, uh, the, the uh, hard processing work over the last uh, over the last uh, couple of years. So earthquakes and the um, Alpine Himalayan belt have been very deadly. Each of these circles on this map is an earthquake that's killed at least 10,000 people. And three quarters of the earthquakes that have killed more than 10,000 people since 1900 have occurred in the Alpine Himalayan belt. So it's been a, been a focus for our work within Comet to try and improve our understanding of seismic hazard in this region. So. What I want to present today, really, I'm going to summarize and structure the talk via our, our workflow and how we how we want to go from the inside data to improved seismic hazard analysis in the region. So we start by making interferograms. We invert for those um, in terms of their um, uh, frame by frame for line of sight velocities. We then reference those to the GNSS data to get unified fields inverting those then for 3D velocities and strain rates, and finally talking a little bit at the end about how we then go from that to seismic hazard. So to make interferograms, we do this with the LIXAR uh, procedure, which is a, a set of routines that are based around, uh, around the Gamma software. For more details, you can look at Milan Lezeki's poster or read him his uh, article in Remote Sensing published last year. We essentially form interferograms with the four closest previous acquisitions, plus additional pairs to improve the network as needed. These are corrected with, with DACOS uh, and unwrapped in space. Um, so all of these data that we've been processing are available for download uh, from the Comet Lixar portal for free. Um, there's something like 450,000 interferograms now online, um, and there's a link there at the bottom. About uh, 277,000 of those are in the Alpine Himalayan belt, which kind of reflects our, our focus for processing. Once you've got all those data, you can do things like this, of course, which produce beautiful maps of coherence, um, which you know this I think is a, a really spectacularly beautiful data set. Um, if you zoom in on the Tibetan plateau, you can see lots of interesting features in just in the coherence maps alone. Tibet is relatively has relatively high coherence, which is helpful. For, uh, for our study of that particular region. So once we have those, um, those uh, interferograms, we invert frame by frame for line of sight velocities. We do this using the LixPass uh, code, which is an open source time series code based on a modified NSPass approach. And there are more details of that in the paper by Yu Morishita, again published last year in Remote Sensing. So we generate velocities for every frame where we have Lixar data. So there's about 1,400 frames, so covering something like 90 million square kilometers. For, our, for this routine processing, we just do that at one kilometer resolution. Um, obviously, we could do it at full resolution, but it, it's quicker at one kilometer resolution. The quality, of course, varies from location to location. One of the main indicators of quality is the time span of the, the network that we, we've processed. And, and so this is just a map showing that maximum time span for different frames on the ascending tracks in the Alpine Himalayan belt. And you can see that large portions of this do have around five years of data, but there are still some areas where we're catching up with the processing. And these are the velocities. This is just what comes out of LixPass. What you can see is that a lot of these have, have ramps in them that we think is due to residual ionosphere and troposphere, but probably largely ionosphere 
if we remove those, we can see um, a relative line of sight velocity for each frame uh, relative to the kind of average deformation. And already you see lots of interesting features, most of which are non-tectonic, particularly these signals in Iran uh, that uh, were a focus of uh, Maddie, Maddie Motar's talk in another session this morning. Um, but um, so there's lots of information in here. If you flick between the ascending and the descending, you can see, for example, those features in Iran uh, remain very similar in both, suggesting that they're largely vertical in this case, consistent with water subsidence. There are some tectonic features. A few big things leap out, like uh, this signal to do with a, a, an earthquake on the Iran-Iraq border. There's some post-seismic signals around here associated with the Baluchistan earthquake. And if you squint, you can see some features around some of the larger, larger faults. But actually, when you present the data like this, with uh, where that's locally referenced, you're actually removing a, a lot of those long wavelength tectonic signals. So it's hard to see the tectonics. So what we need to do to bring out the tectonics um, is to reference all of those in cell velocities to GPS, GNSS data. A standard approach we've used for that in the past is, uh, is such as in papers by Ekbal Hussain and Jonathan Weiss on Anatolia, is first of all to com compile a high quality GNSS velocity field, then to interpolate that and project into the INSAR line of sight. And then you solve for the best fit plane or quadratic surface to adjust the INSAR velocities onto the uh, GNSS reference frame. And this is the ascending and descending data for Anatolia. And when you do that, you can see the tectonics, particularly this color change across the North Anatolian fault here associated with, with right lateral motion on that fault. Uh, you can then use an assumption. Uh, for example, what we, we've typically used is, is an assumption that the north-south velocity fields um, from GNSS are correct. And so we remove those and then we can reproject to calculate the east-west and vertical uh, velocity fields under that assumption. And again, you see rather beautifully the, the, the westward motion of Anatolia with the North Anatolian Fault and the East Anatolian Fault highlighted very nicely. The vertical fields, um, I think a lot of the noise terms, I think some of these fading signals that we've, we've heard about, we currently don't correct for, but we'll, we can talk about that later if you want. But um, we see some of those signals, I think, in the vertical. We also see uh, signals associated with water extraction, for example, here in, in central uh, Anatolia. Um, so this, this method works um, well if you've got good GNSS, but if the GNSS is sparse, it, it's not so straightforward. So what we've done for Tibet at the other end of the Alpine Himalayan belt is to actually combine the inversion of a velocity field with the referencing into a single step. So we jointly invert the GNSS and the INSAR line of sight velocities using the VELMAP approach, which is described in, in this paper by Wang and Wright in 2012. Um, what that involves is setting up a, a mesh and we solve for the uh, velocities of the nodes on this mesh of spherical triangles. And at the same time, we solve the reference frame adjustment parameters for each INSAR track. So this is the data coverage for the mesh for Tibet that we used. These, um, you can see just about hopefully the, the black GPS vectors on there, but also you can see the color, the colors just show the INSAR data. And here's the result. Here's the, uh, the 3D velocity field inverted on that mesh. Um, for the Tibetan plateau. What you can see here in the top left, we've got the east component, the top right, the vertical component, and the bottom left, the, the north component. So we're just using horizontal GNSS in this current inversion. Um, and the, so the vertical is just coming out from the INSAR alone. And I think that's probably one of the most interesting things you see here are, the, are these potential long wavelength vertical signals, perhaps consistent with the, the buckling uh, long wavelength buckling that's been proposed by Bischoff and, and Flesh. Um, you also see in the strain field some concentrations of strain around some of the, the major structures. In the east component, you see this gradual eastward motion kind of peaking around here before the, before the velocity swing around the eastern syntaxes. Um, I should have said, don't believe anything outside to this red line, which is the location of a mesh. Now, if you just compare between the GNSS only field and the INSAR and GNSS field, you see you see more detail in the INSAR field. You're also damping down some of the noise, I think. So some where you've where you've got relatively sparse GNSS, any small variations in those GNSS data can give you some areas of noise. 
Um, if we look at the fits to the uh, look at the inside mosaics, this is first of all this is locally referenced, so this is with the ramps removed. So this is really the information that's there in the inside data. This is what it's adding uh, that's not represented by a long wavelength ramp. Uh, but if you add those ramps back in, then you get to see the, the tectonic motion rather rather beautifully, I think, in, in these velocity fields in, in ascending and descending here. In particular, you can see these changes in, in colour across the, the Kunlun Fault, the Altintar Fault, and some of, the, some of these other faults in northeast Tibet as well. Um, and the model, this is data model, a residual for that 3D velocity model produced by VELMAP. And it does a pretty good job. Um, doing this. So we, we end up fitting the INSAR to around 2.3 millimetres per year in the GNSS to about 1.2. I think the relative difference there reflects the noise levels in the two different data sets. You can, once you've done that adjustment, you can then, of course, invert directly for the uh, eastward velocity and the vertical velocity, again, assuming that the north velocities are, um, from GNSS are correct and obviously they're not correct so that's an error source that comes into the vertical velocity in particular um, but again you can see these these sharp signals associated with some of these faults and this is this is work that we can do at higher resolution than that. this is just a low resolution uh, in the quick and dirty inversion here if you do more detailed work though then the all of these results so far have been produced from the automatic processing results um, some of the PhD students within Comet have been working on um, on uh, on various different areas within Tibet. This is the Altin Tag fault produced by Lin Shen in her in her PhD that she uh, com completed uh, uh, six months ago or so, and she also has a poster on in, at this meeting about this work. What you can see on the Altin Tag fault here is this this very clear change in the east-west velocity as you go across that fault. Um, and in particular, you see some nice features, for example, at the western end of the fault, you can see that the, the strain uh, follows a southern branch rather than curving around uh, onto the Karakash uh, branch. If we look in northeast Tibet, so this is work done by Chi Yu, again, as part of her PhD that's now, that she also finished about six months ago. And she has a talk uh, later in this meeting presenting these results. But again, really beautiful uh, east, west and vertical fields, but also in the strain really nicely localizes onto some of these, uh, these structures. So essentially, if you, the automatic results work really well for this kind of view uh, but actually at the moment we're still at the point where doing the bespoke uh, higher resolution processing gives us more detail and, and uh, fewer errors um, we're trying to introduce as much learning from these bespoke studies into the automatic processing so that hopefully eventually we'll get as good results with the automatic processing so finally, um, what we do is take those results and try and say something about uh, seismic hazard. And I'm not going to talk too much about this. There's a lot more detail in a presentation by Chris Rollins that he gave as part of the Detect seminar series um, that you should be able to find online. Um, and there's some, some more detail in his, his talk later on in this meeting. Um, but essentially, if you've got the geodetic strain that sets the budget for the amount of uh, of, uh, of earthquakes, the amount of seismic moment that could be released in earthquakes. And if you've got the seismicity magnitude frequency distribution, you can combine that with the moment constraint from the geodesy to say something about both the maximum magnitude um, of uh, an earthquake in a region and also um, its um, its recurrence interval. And you can potentially uh, split that, or split that uh, in space to get information that's really useful for seismic hazard. And it's not just dependent on when the most recent earthquake has taken place. So there's a lot more uh, detailed presentations in this meeting. Um, and uh, I'm going to try and uh, not talk about all of these, but these are some on uh, a variety of talks on deformation, tectonic deformation in the Alpine Himalayan belt. Uh, there's also a range of talks on the various methods that we've used and posters as well. Um, there's talks on and um, posters on tectonics elsewhere in the world. There's also a range of volcanic talks, um, as well as some some posters um, on uh, other uh, other aspects of deformation. So um, this is really trying to advertise everything that's going on within in Comet and the and Licks in particular. So just to wrap up, um, automatic processing enables us to produce these large scale velocity fields. 
joint inversions of velocities and reference frame adjustments, I think is useful, particularly when the GNSS density is relatively sparse. Um, this uh, Tibet scale in in cell velocity field shows broad scale deformation um, as well as localized strain around some major structures. So I think it's there's something there for people who believe in block models and something there for people who prefer continuum models. So it's something for everyone. Um, I think we're still at the, the case where so the state where detailed bespoke studies of individual areas give us improved results, um, but further refinement of the results from the automatic processing, I think, will lead to strain rates that can be useful for seismic hazard assessment. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Exactly 15 minutes. Very good. Uh, uh, thanks for this fantastic overview of the LICS results. Um, I think we just move straight on to the third talk, which is going to be given by Theodora Papadopoulou. And that's Hi. on G Hello. The title is Geohazard Lab Initiative Satellite EO Exploitation and Processing Services to support to the support of the Geohazards community. So are you able to share your screen? Uh, yes, just a second. Okay, perfect. Uh... Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so today's presentation is about the Geohazards Lab, an initiative led by the European Space Agency and Bergem, uh, the French uh, Geological Survey, uh, but also supported uh, by various contributors, primarily in Europe, such as uh, CNES, uh, DLR, and the Italian Space Agency. So the Geohazards Lab is an initiative that uh, is uh, that was developed in the frame of uh, the CEOs Working Group Disasters. Uh, CEO stands for the Committee of Earth Observation Satellites, and it has various thematic activities, such as the landslide pilot, the seismic hazards demonstrator, the volcano demonstrator, and the recovery observatory. Uh, so most of the activities of the CEOs Working Group Disasters focus on the provision of satellite Earth observation data, while the Geohazards Lab is basically a platform uh, that provides data access and an online processing and e-collaboration environment uh, for the assessment of geohazards and their impact. So the main pillar of the Geohazards Lab is the Geohazards Exploitation Platform of ESA, or shortly we call it JEP. JEP is one of ESA's uh, thematic exploitation platforms. Uh, it's uh, developed based on a federation of satellite EO data and methods. It combines uh, uh, services such as on-demand processing services, systematic services that are data-driven. Uh, it uh, provides a mass massive cloud computing power, uh, uh, as well as access to open EO data, uh, archive data collections, but also specific data collections uh, for limited users, and I will explain all these in the next slides. So provision to open EO data uh, are, for example, uh, provision, uh, uh, data access to Copernicus Sentinel, uh, but also Landsat 8 data. Uh, basically, any uh, registered user simply with a, with a simple registration on the platform can actually access this data. This is the simplest uh, form of data access. Uh, then we also have other data collections such as the ESA, Heritage, um, Heritage Missions, ERS and Envisat. We have a global coverage uh, and the platform is synchronized uh, with the ESA virtual archive providing access to more than 70 terabytes of data. And also through specific agreements uh, with uh, the CEOs Working Group Disasters and the GSNL, which is uh, the, the Geohazard Super Sites Initiative. Uh, we have limited private collections of ALOS2, Terrasar X, Cosmos SkyMed, Pleiad and Radarsa2 data uh, that are accessible only to um, authorized users. And uh, just to mention here that Pleiad data imagery is uh, accessible only for online processing. Uh, a quick overview of the user base. Uh, basically, we have more than 
uh, 100 uh, users, we call them early adopters. They are spread worldwide. Uh, they're primarily based in Europe, uh, but we also have users in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Uh, more than 90% of the user base is from public institutions, uh, but we have also a few users from the private sector. Uh, a typical example of uh, a JEP user is uh, a scientist uh, with expertise in satellite Earth observation uh, based in geoscience centers, institutions, academia. Uh, an example uh, could be, for example, a scientist from USGS uh, working uh, uh, in, for volcano mapping uh, or volcano monitoring in, uh, in South America. Uh, we have users from the GSNL, the SEALS Working Group Disasters Activities, but also from the broader uh, geohazards community. And um, uh, other end users, such as decision makers or uh, national disaster management authorities, are not intended to be the direct users of the geohazards lab, but we expect them to receive and use the products that are generated on the platform. Uh, this is uh, an overview of the processing services that are available on the platform. We have more than 25 uh, processing services uh, on demand or system. Just to give you some examples, uh, the DLR Insert Browse Medium Resolution Service is one of the systematic services that are available via JEP. Uh, it's data driven, which means that every time, as soon as the data are available through uh, the Copernicus hub, because in this case we're talking about Sentinel-1 uh, data, uh, the, the service is triggered and uh, generates uh, about, uh, it processes more than 150 pairs of Sentinel-1 data per day. An example of on-demand service is the PSBAS Sentinel-1 service uh, developed by CNR IREA. Uh, the service generates uh, deformation time series and mean velocity maps using Sentinel-1 SLC data as input. Uh, here you can see uh, actually a screenshot from uh, the platform uh, showing the output of the results over the Sulawesi uh, area in Indonesia after the earthquake uh, that hit Indonesia in 2018. Uh, another type of service that was actually developed and uh, set in operation since July 2019 is the automatic USGS pager alerting system. Uh, basically for every earthquake with a magnitude higher than five, uh, the, the the JEP is triggered, uh, triggering a number of services such as uh, Diapason or the MPIC Opt uh, earthquake service of CNRS EOS uh, to generate pre and post seismic interferograms. Uh, an example you can see here in the bottom uh, is uh, the results from the Diapason service that was generated once uh, the USGS pager sent us alerts for the M7.1 earthquake uh, of Eastern California. Uh, here is an example of a service that was actually developed in the frame of the Geohazards Lab. It's called Snapping from Surveys Motion Mapping. Uh, it was developed by the Aristotelian University of Thessaloniki in Greece, uh, Mipha Geodesia Jain and Terra Due. Uh, and it's based on ESA Snap and Stamps packages. And it actually produces surface displacement measurements in two steps. The first step being the snapping IFG, which basically generates the interferogram stack. And the second one being the snapping PSI, which uh, basically generates the time series. Uh, and the snapping visualizer is, a, a, let's say, an, an auxiliary service to snapping, uh, which basically allows visualization uh, offline with uh, the generation of a standalone HTML file. Uh, that can be open to any browser, and it's very useful to, especially to users with limited internet access, so without the need to to ingest uh, into any geospatial database for for the measurements. Uh, the last uh, example of uh, of activity is the Federation of Resources. 
uh, basically uh, resources of the HPC Meso Center of University of Strasbourg, which is part of the formatter research infrastructure, uh, can be actually run via uh, three services that are, uh, that are available to the JEP. Uh, the three services are using optical imagery, Sentinel-2 and Pleiad. Uh, and have been developed uh, for landslide uh, mapping, but can actually be applied to other um, uh, themes, such as earthquake. Uh, an example I would give you, uh, out of the three uh, services, we have pixel offset tracking and pick opt. And in particular, the MPIC opt earthquake um, uh, is for post seismic ground motion. You can see here uh, an example of north, south, and east-west uh, uh, east -west, uh, displacement fields uh, for concerning deformation uh, of the 2018 Sulawesi earthquake in Indonesia. Uh, these results were generated using two uh, pairs of Sentinel-2 acquisitions, a pair uh, pre-earthquake and one post-earthquake, and the result was generated on the JEP platform. Uh, a last part of our activities is uh, uh, how we try to promote our results. Uh, in fact, we're trying to animate the community and also communicate the scientific results. We're trying to do that uh, through various media. Uh, it can be Twitter, it can be the ESA website with uh, short web articles that we might um, uh, share from time to time. It might be through the JEP blog but also we're trying to use the JEP and have hands-on trainings uh, when possible uh, in order to um, support uh, awareness about INSAR uh, and specific services. And uh, finally, a few take-home messages. Uh, the first one, which is the most important, is that it's Clearly, that we have benefits for fast access to Earth observation data via the JEP. We have storage capacity and also processing resources that uh, one cannot find easily, especially with limited um, uh, local uh, CPU and memory. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, what I just mentioned in my previous slides, the platform e-collaboration and the fact that we do uh, continuous efforts to promote uh, innovation and promote the services and also the, the products. Uh, an important point for the current users, but also for future users, is that the users remain owners of their services, their products, and everything. In fact, the user is able to share their results, to, to decide whether to keep them private, to share them only with a small group. Uh, and that's the same also for the services that are integrated in, in the JEP uh, from the users. And finally, uh, the platform is basically a partnership that needs continued support uh, from uh, the scientists uh, that are working in satellite uh, EO and developers in order to offer uh, the operational services that provide added value to the community. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this uh, interesting talk. Um, I'm sure there will be increasing number of users in the future. I think uh, Cecile is going to pre to introduce next speaker. Yes, so it's my, my job to introduce the French speakers, apparently, with tricky French names. So the next talk will be given by uh, Laetitia Lemrabe. She will present a uh, work on the eastern part of the Tibetan plateau using uh, Sentinel-1 in South Time series. So, uh, Laetitia, you can share the screen. Uh, actually, I don't have the button to, to share the yes, screen. Yes, it should, uh, you should have permission soon, I guess. Thank you. It's okay. Okay, now you can start. Okay. Is it okay? Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today I will present you the progress of my work uh, about tectonic studies at continental scale 
on the eastern part of the Tibetan plateau from time series analysis of Sentinel-1 in Sardata. So the Tibetan plateau is a major relief resulting from the collision initiated 55 million years ago between the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate. Uh, it is composed by several large uh, active strike slip faults. Uh, to the north of the plateau, we have the Altimital fault here, the high one fault here on the eastern part. In the central part, we have the Kundun fault and the Yushu Gandhi and Changshuru uh, extremely active uh, Changshuru fault here uh, in the southern part. Uh, we can see also uh, three first faults, uh, long riba here, long mention, and the blue segment here. And the combination of these uh, major faults uh, accommodates uh, the deformation generated by the uh, overall uh, estuary extrusion of this plateau, as you can see here on the, on the GPS measurement. And we know that uh, the Sentinel-1 mission marks a significant uh, breakthrough uh, in the Earth observation with a large volume of high-resolution recurring data. And our aim here is to show uh, the contribution of the Sentinel-1 SAR data in understanding the strain partitioning in the region. And to help us in this task, uh, we rely on a new NSAR processing service created, sorry, created uh, to exploit the full potential, potential, the full potential of Sentinel-1 uh, in SAR data, the FlatSim service. So the FlatSim service is operated by ICNES in the framework of the French Data and Services Center formator, in collaboration with uh, several French laboratories here. It proposes an automated production of interferograms and time series uh, over uh, large uh, geographical areas to ensure the spatiotemporal monitoring of critical regions prone to natural hazards. Uh, the service is based on the new small uh, temporal and spatial baseline processing chain with the following specificities. So we process uh, long tracks up to 600 kilometers long with a 100 kilometer of overlap between a contiguous section of a track. For each image, uh, we build the interferograms using the next three consecutive images and those after three months and one year. We estimate the spectral diversity and correct for atmospheric phase delays using ERA5 models. We use a special graphic based on coherent paths and uh, during the final time series inversion to retrieve the evolution of the wrong displacement, uh, an automated correction of unwrapping error is included. So at the end, uh, we obtain three kinds of products, interferograms, time series, and auxiliary data. And if you want further uh, details about this service, I invite you to see the, the dedicated e-poster on number 438 here uh, to have more detail about technical points. So the eastern part of the Tibetan plateau uh, served as a first qualification test site for the service. Uh, we processed about 120 radar images uh, per track between 2014 and 2020. Uh, 600 uh, interferograms per track uh, were computed with a large proportion of uh, three months and one year interferograms to limit fast biases, as shown in green and blue here on this, uh, interfer uh, on this histogram. And uh, all the SIM programs, uh, the flat SIM projects, final flat SIM projects, has uh, finally a spatial resolution of 100, 120 meters. And in our study here, we exploited the time series products from flat SIM to extract uh, different contributions, a linear velocity term and a seasonal term. So here I present uh, linear velocity maps in line of sight in ascending geometry on the left and descending geometry on the right, corrected from ramps generated by the acquisition uh, geometry of Sentinel-1 satellites. Uh, and in ascending geometry, positive value uh, corresponds to a movement toward the satellite, and a negative value corresponds to a movement away from the satellite, and 
what we can notice here is that there are two things. The first one is that the velocities are negative, so the overall region is moving away from the satellite, so towards the east direction, and that is uh, consistent with the GPS uh, measurement. And the, first, the second thing is that we observe a strong velocity gradient across the main strike slip poles here and here and here. As example, in south of Kunlun here, uh, ground moves toward east faster in the south than the ground uh, in the north. And it highlights the left lateral motion of this major fault. And this is consistent with the observation on descending tracks. So here the, the color code is inverted due to the descending geometry. So here the, hair, the red part here moves faster toward east than the blue part here. So it strikes the fault again. The movement of the Altin tag fault is uh, only visible on ascending geometry. Uh, we observe how the slip here is uh, transferred to the higher end fault towards the northeastern part of the plateau. Motion along the uh, Changshuo fault system is mainly visible on descending tracks with a high velocity gradient here on the southeastern part of the segment, which is now to creep. At first order, we mainly see a large uh, tectonic movement at continental scale. But if we zoom in the area, uh, we can see a large number of informations uh, showing other types of signals. So here, a first example concerning a short wavelength signal encountered in the mountainous uh, areas. This signal is seen in descending geometry. And uh, when we look at this area in on uh, ascending uh, tracks, we notice that the sign is uh, reversed. Uh, the sign is reversed, pointing to a, a horizontal motion. Here is an illumination of the topography by the radar in the sounding geometry, highlighting ridges and uh, slopes. So the light gray areas uh, correspond to slopes facing the radar sensor. And the, the dark uh, gray area corresponds to the slopes in the shadow of the radar line of sight. And here we interpret the signal as a gravitational motion on both sides of the mountain ridge, uh, aided by free zone cycles. The second example uh, concerns uh, this area with the positive velocities of high amplitude. By observing this area on uh, on Google Earth, we notice that the signal follows quite well the, the contours of the structure representing a low and flat basin uh, regarding to the topography. And if we look at the geological map, uh, we notice that the signal is especially correlated uh, with quaternary sediments poorly uh, consolidated. So here we are probably in presence of hydrological phenomena in a discharge zone at the base of a large alluvial fans. This is it for what we can see uh, on uh, the linear velocity maps. And now I'm going to talk about the seasonal signals. And here I represent the sinus and the cosine uh, amplitude, uh, the sinus and the cosine amplitude in descending geometry. Uh, here, a positive uh, Amplitude on the sinus uh, corresponds to an uplift in spring and or a subsidence in fall. And even if it's not uh, that simple, the, the analysis uh, of the sinus seasonal component highlights hydrological signal, uh, such as groundwater fluctuation in basins, like here, for example, around this lake, and permafrost freeze cycles, uh, like here, uh, in south of Kumu. And concerning the, the, the cosine amplitude to the right, so here a positive signal corresponds to an uplift in winter or a subsidence in summer. And on this component, we similarly uh, observe uh, hydrological signals, but also uh, in the southeastern part of the plateau, uh, residual atmospheric signals in deeply inside valleys. So all of uh, the signals are observed, uh, all of the signals observed here are uh, 
consistent uh, are also seen uh, uh, on the uh, ascending tracks. So here are the positive signals here in the south of Kumu. And uh, we, we see again uh, the, uh, the groundwater level fluctuation here around uh, this lake. And these maps uh, of seasonal deformation can be used to mask uh, areas with a strong non tectonic deformation when analyzing the linear velocity maps for uh, tectonic studies. And this is what, uh, and I did it here. So here I present some uh, line of sight velocity profiles across the main fault in the area. So the green data uh, represents the line of sight velocity profiles. And the black data are uh, the corresponding elevation profiles. And on the top profile, uh, we clearly observe a velocity gradient about one centimeter per year across the semi-sphere of fault. On the alt tag fault here uh, at 92 degrees uh, of uh, longitude, we observe a velocity gradient of only a few millimeters per year. And we guess that because of the slip, parti slip partitioning thrust, uh, with the thrust in the KDM basins here, uh, and the KDM shan, and slip transfer towards the uh, high one fold uh, that we can see here on this profile, uh, with a velocity gradient of about four millimeter per year. Uh, on this profile, we see also the termination of the cooling fault here with the velocity gradient. And here we see the crunctural fault uh, with a sharp velocity gradient due to a seismic slip uh, well described uh, in the literature. Again, we have a nice consistency with the sign and amplitude in ascending geometry with the reverse sign due to the dominating. Uh, strike slip motion, and uh, the Coulomb fault here uh, show a similar, uh, similar uh, loss velocity gradient. But here on the alting type fault, uh, we can see that the signal is clearer due to the better orientation of the uh, line of sight of the satellite. So now I'm going to talk uh, for quickly introduce the, the agreement between the our SAR velocities and GPS velocities in this area. So here I show a velocity profile in the direction of the track uh, D77. Black dots correspond to SAR data, GPS data are represented uh, by uh, red dots, and here it's a uh, the GPS data in the surrounding of one inside data to the mean. And after adjustment, uh, with a minimum of parameters uh, between the two data sets, we have uh, a good agreement between the standard deviation of about, uh, with, the standard, uh, with the standard deviation. And this agreement is about uh, one millimeter per year, as you can see here on this uh, histogram. Two minutes. Uh, finally, uh, we perform a decomposition of our inside velocity field into horizontal and vertical components. So we made an assumption. Uh, we decided, so we consider that horizontal displacement. Uh, so on this figure, oh, I'm going to start with this, uh, this figure. We decided to, we made an hypothesis uh, that the horizontal motion is parallel to the azimuth of the GPS horizontal velocity vector. And we obtained finally uh, these results uh, for the decomposition. So on the left, it is the horizontal velocity along local GPS velocity azimuth direction, and on the right, the vertical velocity. And uh, we can see that the horizontal velocity maps clearly uh, highlight a motion uh, along the cooling fault with a complex slip transfer here to the control fault. We can also see a thrust, also accommodate the slip transfer from the alting tag fault progressively to the high one fault, with the main steps in here and here, of course, the, the thrust. And we also can see uh, the dextral behavior of the long tag fault. And here for the vertical component, uh, we see that the subsidence, we see subsidence in sedimentary basins affected by the seasonal phenomena.
Hier, elle suit une superimpose un masque, un seasonal mask. Black color correspond to low seasonal signal and transparent areas correspond to areas where the signal, seasonal signal is high. And we see that uh, the, the high seasonal signal is well correlated with high amplitude in vertical uh, displacement. To conclude, uh, flat seam products are operational to monitor surface deformations at large scale and high uh, resolution, uh, spatial resolution. The source separation between the linear and seasonal signal uh, uh, highlight tectonic surface deformation, hydrological phenomena, and atmospheric phase residuals. The horizontal velocity map shows a uh, nice spatial continuity, even in areas affected by seasonal signals. And as a perspective, we are currently visiting elastic block models derived from the, the literature uh, from sparse uh, GNSS data uh, to refine uh, fault coupling and kinematics and strain localization. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Leticia. So we'll have to move directly to the next talk. Uh, so we'll move to Mexico, actually. The talk will be given by uh, Erwan Papi. Erwin Patier, it's a work done uh, by Louise Mauban, uh, but again presented by Erwin uh, today. Yeah. So, okay, can you hear me? Erwin, yes. Okay, can okay. you see my presentation? Okay. So, uh, yes, so it is a, this presentation is um, uh, the PhD work of uh, Louise Mauban, who uh, unfortunately uh, cannot do the presentation today, so I'm, I'm doing a eat and bath of her. Um, other people involved in this study uh, were in Easter, Mathilde Radguet, Marie-Pierre Douin, and Simon, uh, Marie -Pierre Douin. Uh, Simon Daou uh, was in uh, Oxford at that time when he collaborated for this uh, work. And there's also people from uh, University of uh, Mexico, uh, Ekaterina Kazashnikina and Vladimir Kostoglodov. Okay, so I will talk about the source slip event and the lateral variation of interseismic crippling in the Mexican uh, subduction zone using Sentinel-1 uh, in SAR time series. Um, so first, I will uh, start with uh, some uh, description of the characteristic of the Mexican subduction zone. So we are on the uh, Pacific coast of uh, Mexico. Um, so in this place, there is a, a long subduction zone, which is about uh, 1,500 kilometers long from uh, here, from the west to the east. Um, this subduction corresponds to the uh, convergence of the Rivera and Cocos plate uh, uh, that subduct below the North American plate at a slip of between two centimeter up to seven centimeter of uh, convergence rate. Um, in uh, light blue are represented the past uh, 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 historical uh, event, uh, instrumental event uh, that occur in this area with a recurrent stay about uh, 30, 50 years. So that breaks almost all the subduction since uh, 100 years, uh, but with some uh, seismic gap like uh, in the Guerrero area or in the Chiapas area here. Um, so, uh, there are regularly so th this earthquake, and the last um, um, uh, sequence, significant seismic sequence of earthquake occurs between 2017 and 2020 with uh, four major earthquakes. Uh, so, two intra plate uh, earthquakes, the, this one in uh, Chiapas and this one in Tulebo, but also two um, uh, uh, interface uh, subduction earthquakes in um, Pinetopa here and Oaraca. Um, the dark blue lines here highlight the, play, the, the, the 10 centimeter slip contours of large slow slip events that are mainly aseismic uh, slip on the fault interface that release uh, some of the stress uh, uh, due to the uh, conver plate convergence. So you have several uh, contours because there's uh, regularly this kind of large event. Here are presented the, the four last, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the event from 2002, 2006, 2010, and the, uh, the last one in, in, uh, in Guerrero. And there are also events uh, with a smaller magnitude 
uh, equivalent magnitude that occur every two years. So here the equivalent magnitude is about 6.9, but in this area, in Guerrero, it's more about 7.5 uh, uh, equivalent magnitude for such uh, events. Uh, also represented on this map are the uh, area where you have, there are large tectonic tremor activities. So tremors are uh, six seismic signals that are uh, associated to sleep on the subduction interface uh, that can be associated to slow sleep event, but also to uh, uh, other uh, smaller uh, burst of uh, a seismic release of, uh, of uh, stress in, in the area. So in this subduction, we have a succession of loading and release period that could be seismic or aseismic. Here, we show that the one that has been observed during the interseismic phase at different, uh, and they can be observed at different uh, uh, time scale. Uh, here, we show the large event, but there's also smaller events uh, that can be observed in this area. So the question of the physical processes and parameters that control the spatial and temporal variability uh, are important, but are still poorly understood in, the, in such a subduction zone. So to uh, uh, address this issue, we use uh, two kinds of data represented on this map. So uh, INSA data uh, with Sentinel-1 uh, tracks. So we have here four Sentinel-1 descending track and one ascending one. And also GNSS station represented by uh, the small um, dash, uh, the small um, uh, dot here. Uh, there is about uh, 60 uh, GPS uh, uh, GNSS station in this area. And I should emphasize that for most, uh, there, there has been some studies in the past uh, using INSA, uh, mainly uh, mainly focused on the Guerrero area where uh, you have so sleep event, but very few studies have uh, investigated the uh, Michoacan and Jalisco area uh, that uh, will be uh, included in, in our study. Okay, so as I told you, the main scientific question are what are the main parameters that control the variability of loading and release period in subduction zone? And to answer this kind of this question, we need homogeneous estimation of interseismic deformation on large portion of subduction zone, as large as possible, so that we can cover a wide a wide range of cases that can occur on subduction zone. So that's why we choose we target the Mexican subduction zone that show this this uh, wide range of cases. And in this study, we first uh, want to investigate what are the role of soft sleep events, especially the last one that occurred in 2017, 2020, and what are also the spatial variation of coupling along uh, the subduction. So to do that, uh, we will do INSAR time series analysis in, in conjunction with the GNSS network. And also, this in the specificity of the study is that we it involves a sort of uh, a methodological uh, research to how to separate a source, especially atmosphere and tectonic uh, uh, source in the in sourcing. And uh, we also use a geodetic inversion uh, to infer the slip distribution and the coupling. Okay, so for the insert processing, uh, we use the S. An SBAS approach using the NSBAS method that uh, Leticia just uh, presented uh, before. But basically, uh, we do that on a, uh, an interprogram network of small baseline approach with several steps uh, up to uh, having um, all the stack of interprogram, uh, unwrap interprogram. And then we can have a time series uh, of uh, uh, the phase evolution. And you can see in this example uh, that uh, what is dominating in this area, you have large variability, is the atmosphere. So this is a spatial uh, map in full time. And here you have an example of uh, the uh, uh, time series for a given point. And you see the displacement, the equivalent displacement are about uh, up to uh, uh, five uh, centimeter to minus two uh, centimeter, which correspond mainly to uh, atmospheric signal. That are in this area, large uh, dominate the tectonic signal, especially the one from source data. So we need methods to separate uh, atmosphere from tectonic signal in, in this area. So we 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 test two different methods. Uh, first method is a parametric decomposition, and uh, another one uh, is independent component analysis. So for the first one, uh, we use a parametric decomposition that in which we model the signal using uh, several parameters that uh, 
uh, model the linear term, uh, uh, but also can model earthquake. And interestingly, we introduce what we call the atmospheric fast spring term. That uh, is the blue one represented here. That is estimating using zenithal delay from GNSS station. So basically, we use uh, the network of GNSS station to estimate uh, uh, the pattern of atmospheric signal in the area, and we use it uh, as a, in the equation to uh, have the parameter. Um, so if we to apply that to the 2017-2018 SOSDIP event using an ascending and a descending track um, of Sentinel-1 data, in this case, the parametric decomposition introduces a linear term, the atmospheric term, and to model the slow sleep event, we use these uh, two parameters, C1 and C2, that correspond to uh, uh, the fact that uh, from GNSS time theory, we see that the slow sleep event is basically constituted of two phases that can be modeled by this kind of uh, equation. So we will invert this parameter. So uh, what we do, we have or signal we decompose in this by these four uh, components. As a result, uh, we get this kind of uh, map. So the first uh, the map on the left corresponds to the amplitude of the atmospheric components uh, that corresponds to the, the, the atmospheric part, which is uh, clearly correlated with the, uh, 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 the topography. And on the right, you have the uh, tectonic, uh, the amplitude of the slow sleep event uh, displacement, so the component related to the uh, tectonic displacement. Um, sorry. So we also investigate another method. I will just be quick on it, uh, which is independent component analysis. We do not rely on GNSS uh, uh, a prior uh, in, uh, information. Uh, before we use the zenithal tropospheric delay as an a priori information in our, our decomposition. In this one, there is no uh, uh, information from GNSS. And we get uh, a similar result. And the interesting thing of the independent component analysis is ability to reproduce actually to, to one of the components we extract, which is very close to uh, the atmospheric zenithal delay. So it is a very, we are very sort of happy to, to, to see this uh, very uh, good decomposition. And we can also compare the slow sleep displacement, which is in good agreement with the GPS uh, uh, displacement. So we, if we compare the two methods, ICA and parametric decomposition, we have this uh, uh, good agreement between them. So then we invert uh, this data to uh, get the sleep distribution on the, on, the, on the interface using a 3D geometry uh, slab. Uh, with a, which is have a flat part in this area of, uh, in, in which we invert this. Uh, yeah. So the result, um, so we, uh, we use, it's an elastic uh, homogeneous uh, space uh, inversion. So are the result from the two uh, methods we get from IC and parametric separation. So we get a sleep distribution uh, that show an equivalent slow sleep event of magnitude 7.2 with a maximum uh, sleep of 8 centimeters. And in the case of the parametric uh, separation, we have a, a higher uh, displacement up to 12 centimeters. So the, the blue line corresponds to the ISO contour of our uh, solution, and the green uh, contour corresponds to the previous slow sleep event that occurred in this area. Uh, and it, that are in good uh, uh, agreement. Um, so I will finish now with present you with the we extend. So once we have validated this method, we use uh, that to uh, estimate the interseismic coupling in this area. So to cover the whole the 1,000 kilometer uh, by about five ki uh, 500 kilometer area in this. A part of the subduction zone from Jalisco to uh, uh, Oaxaca using these four tracks. Um, so the objective is to get an homogeneous coping map. So for that, we use uh, the 62 GNSS station and the ISR time, time series using the, Two uh, the parametric separation, uh, separation method. So, and for some tracks, we have to also introduce in the parametric uh, uh, estimation the earthquake that can that occurs in this area. 
so here we don't try to to model the to, uh, to, to subtract before the SS the slow sleep event or the post seismic uh, uh, signal. So it's included in our uh, linear term we are estimating. Uh, so here are the results for the estimation of the linear term for the GPS uh, um, uh, data. So with the horizontal displacement shown by the black arrows and the color showing the up, uplift. And this is a result for the uh, INSA um, estimation of this uh, linear term. So from uh, so you can see here the effect of the slow sleep event and post seismic uh, area. So from that, using plate velocity model, we infer a coupling map that shows uh, that the part in the Michoacan and Jalisco are highly coupled, which is consistent with uh, also a long-term time series uh, of GPS uh, data, because it's only on three years, and also, of course, deco uh, decoupling in the area of uh, slow sleep events. And uh, interestingly, the last event in 2020 uh, is also occurring in the in a partially coupled uh, area we estimated of uh, using data before the event. To conclude, um, we uh, have presented two uh, different source separation methods that we have implemented that are suitable for INSA time series of a large area where we have strong atmospheric signal and very few G GNSS stations. Uh, that, that's the interest of this method. Uh, the parametric decomposition and an independent component uh, analysis. Uh, we show the ability to extract transient slow sleep event signal that are uh, one order of magnitude smaller than the atmospheric signal. And we get consistency distribution for the 2017-2018 uh, slow sleep event in the area. And then we have, uh, uh, for the first time, uh, done an homogeneous uh, coupling map uh, at the scale of the Mexican subduction zone from 2016 to 2019. And we have shown the relatively slow, uh, strong pumping in the Roalisco Michoacan area and the effect of the uh, slow sleep event in the uh, uh, or slow sleep event in such a coupling. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, I Thank you, Roland. Uh, yeah. Very nice. Yes. You can mention something. No, no, just uh, this uh, the part okay. of the source separation has been uh, published by Louise Mauban in, in this paper. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thanks for, for the speakers. Uh, so we will move to the questions. We have a list of questions. Um, we will make we'll give them in the order of the presentations, I think. Uh Shuni, I think there was a question for John at the beginning. Yes, um, maybe we start with the first talk um, on the Philippines, on the Light Island. So uh, you got one question, John, about the sill source that you have shown in your presentation. Uh, if it's a base, uh, based on, yeah, based on my understanding is subsiding, right? Um, and what is the contribution of such deflating sills to the source on the fault itself? So is there a, some kind of a trade-off between the sill source and the vaulting? I think that's what it. Okay. Well, I mean, if the question is in terms of the inversion, well, we checked that um, there was no trade-offs essentially between the rates that we're getting between the sill source and the slip on the fault. They're independent based on when you look at the joint probe uh, distributions of the exterior. Okay, related in the northern part of the island, I have a quick question. Uh, you showed a little bit of slip deficit also in the northern part of the island. Is that significant, you think, or is it a resolution issue? Um, I mean, yes, I think there are some parts uh, that uh, could be a resolution issue, definitely. I mean, if you remember, recall some of the later graphs where I showed the long strike variability of the shallow zip rate, there's some quite big dips and uh, yeah, we they might be related to resolution, actually, and because of the loss of coherence in some parts. So. Well, there's a bay there, so I'm just wondering if there. Is. And also that one, yeah, definitely, yeah, uh, yeah, that one, yeah. It's we don't really have constraints on the near fault uh, displacements in the bay. So I mean, is the fault is a much larger portion of this uh, very long fault creeping, or is it mostly on this island? I think you may have mentioned that in your introduction, but just for curiosity. Yeah, so as as far as we know, creep has 
primarily been observed in this island and later um, there have been no verified observations of creep yet in other parts except uh, uh, reports of like after slip of uh, in some earthquakes. Yeah. Okay, should we move to uh, questions for Tim? He got quite a few. Um, yes, so I see one here. So, um, Tim, do you have any recommendation or any idea on uh, how to tie uh, the long wavelengths into our rate signals uh, when there's no GPS data or when they are not uh, on when they are sparse, basically? Yeah, I think um, there's always, if you zoom out far enough, there's always some uh, GNSS. So, I think one advantage of doing it with the VELMAP approach is that you're you use the available gnss and the insar data together to do the tying and i think that can help i think we do have problems where it's really sparse and so we've resorted in some regions um to making up G gnss so if you feel you've got a good understanding of the kind of tectonic framework i think it's okay to say this part is a a block and it's got this set of velocities that are known and, and imply, imposing those as a boundary. But um, it, it's not straightforward. And I think obviously in the long run, the INSAR only provides you information, I think, on the kind of relative motions uh, within the within the kind of frame that you process. So it's, um, yeah, it's not, not straightforward if it's sparse, but I think doing it with this VELMAP approach does allow you to, um, at least use the information from the INSAR and the GNSS, all of the information that you've got together to do that tying. Okay. Um, I don't see any other question. I, I can add one. In fact, it's related, in fact, to some questions for Leticia after. Uh, so in your strategy at the moment, you, not you don't necessarily include the long temporal baselines. Um, so in the future, do you want to do that or do you prefer a strategy where you would estimate potential biases and correct them or mask them or what, what choice would you, would you do? Yeah, so I think there are some longer ones, but it's, I haven't done the longer term one systematically in the same way that you, you've done that. I think obviously they're, they're helpful, but of course, longer the time span, the less coherence there is. So. We've been developing an approach um, to try to make a correction for these fading signals. And, and there's some promising results from that that you can see in Yasser Maksudi's yes. okay. poster. Okay. So um, I think ideally we'd like to have a correction where we could just use the shorter term interferograms uh, because then, um, then, well, first of all, then we don't have to make hundreds of new interferograms. Um, secondly, uh, of course, we, we get a better coherence map um i think there was another question was there from morgan plain there i think for mm. for me about unwrapping i think there's a quick answer there in that we do we do the unwrapping in space and then um so there is no model um involved in terms of the long term except for when we're fitting or if there's a gap in the in the um in the networks if there's two bits of the network then there's a there's a linear uh, assumption with a, with some seasonality in in NS in the um, the Elixbas inversion that we use to tie the two disconnected parts together. Okay. All right. I don't see questions for uh, Theodora, but uh, maybe I just throw in one for her. So, um, do you have any metrics on? Uh, the users of this platform yet. So, for example, I mean, who are the main users and uh, how is the kind of, is the service being used more and more? Do you see a... Yes, uh, we do. And in fact, I uh, have been involved very much in that. Uh, in fact, the platform has uh, a, a, prof a, a monitoring system and uh, we count uh, a lot of metrics uh, which can be extracted uh, via an automated report. I mean, we can measure performance by, let's say, by user, by, by time period. We can see um, the output for a month or a year. Uh, there are also a few uh, problems that we're trying to resolve. For example, uh, a problem with metrics is that, uh, for example, you see that 
um, uh, there is a column about the success or failure of, uh, of the result. But even if we have a successful result in terms of output, that we have an output, it doesn't really mean that we have a good result, which means that at some point you need also uh, the human eye and experience to, to, to see whether it's successful or not. Uh, but yes, uh, we, we are using that um, uh, in order to see where our users come from, uh, whether we can see uh, common uh, areas of interest or, or themes, so like volcano uh, monitoring, for example. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. So we have a few questions for Leticia. Um, Cecil, do you want to go over some of them? or? So there was Eric Fielding uh, asking about, um, so it's about phase biases. So do you see any phase biases in your velocity estimates uh, over certain areas, such as salt flags, I guess, in Botsaida Basin, for example? Leticia, if you are here, put your, unmute your microphone. Is it okay? Yes. So we didn't analyze this uh, fading signals, but um, we consider that uh, including interferon super to three months uh, in the inversion strongly uh, reduces the impact of the, the phase uh, disease. And uh, there are uh, some synthetic uh, simulation have been done to evaluate uh, the benefit of uh, including uh, long interprograms and the results uh, show that uh, it's an efficient uh, method to, to improve uh, the quality of the phase. So uh, we, we don't know if it's, uh, if uh, the, because in this area we have some high uh, emis and, uh, but we, uh, we don't think that it's due to the phase gases in this area. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the, there was a question from Yasser Maxwelli, but I think it's similar. Could could a part of the deformation signal in your estimated velocity be due to failed signal? So I guess uh, because you you also use short term interferons. So when there is low coherence for long long term, it still be you can still have phase biases. So so we have to do more details for that. Uh, team, uh, question for your vertical signal. Do you think uh, the ver vertical signal is real tectonic vertical signal, or are the vertical motions associated uh, with non-tectonic processes? Uh, okay, so the, um, it's not easy huh, to uh, separate, uh, to evaluate uh, the part of tectonic motion on the vertical component and non-tectonic process. But actually, uh, at some point, uh, we saw, well, we think that uh, some areas show a tectonic process, such as on the Gong Ocean, where we can see uh, a strong uh, uplift signal. So here it would be uh, uh, tectonic signals, but uh, for the other areas on the Tibetan plateau, uh, we didn't analyze it uh, in detail, so we have to see for we have to 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 develop the on, on this question. So I do I I want to say that uh, the, all the vertical motion is not due to non -process, uh, processes uh, uh, tectonic processes. So there is a strong correlation between the, your seasonal mask and the vertical yeah. deformation. So, so it speaks for non-tectonic processes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we are at the end of the questions. For Erwan, I maybe can throw in one question, Erwan. Um, in your view, what is the main difference or the reason for the difference in the solution that you did with ICA and the parametric separation? We've got some differences what is what is uh, causing these differences you think you are muted please unmute yeah sorry thanks uh, yeah uh, so of course there, there are there are some difference uh, there are two independent methods uh, the independent component analysis do not rely at all on uh, on gps so it is possible 
when, when, when you get independent component analysis, so you have to, to, to decide the number of uh, independent components to choose and to attribute them to a physical signal. Uh, but you cannot exclude that uh, there is some leaking of some of the signal in, uh, in some of the components. So that's a drawback in the ICA. You are not sure exactly of which component can be attributed to a physical signal. And in the parametric approach, you have also the drawback of uh, relying on a mathematical model of, of, your, of your displacement. So you have also uncertainty introduced uh, by that, especially for the slow sleep event we model with two phases. Uh, it's uh, an a priori you introduce that can uh, bias uh, also the, the thing. So, uh, of course, you, you have in, uncertainty introduced by the two methods that can explain the differences. Okay, thank you. I think we got a couple more in the end. Yes. Um, do we have time for... Um, okay. Yeah, let's uh, go a little bit over time. So there's one for Tim. Um, he says, when making the mesh, do you have, do you make the vertices along the faults? Or I think, yeah, I think it would result in more accurate strain and concentration as we estimate the strain within the triangles by linear smoothing, I guess. I think, yeah, I yeah. think we've done, we've tried both. And it clearly, when, you're, when your triangles are quite large, it does make a difference. So, um, I think there's two schools of thought. One is exactly as you say, you want to try and, for example, we can have smaller triangles around the, around the faults. Um, yeah. The second school of thought is we don't want to, we don't want to artificially impose uh, where we think the faults are before we, you know, so we don't want to influence the answer by our assumptions. So I think both are worth trying and I, I'm not sure I know the correct thing to do yet. Thanks. So then there is a last from Henriette that's on uh, long wavelength ramps. Um, or for example, the ones in the east to west and vertical projected maps in Leticia's work, just taken as an example, is to everyone. Is, is all that residual uh, atmosphere or are they all the other pro processes? Does anyone want to take that? Um. I don't know. Uh, I would say it depends on the strategy you have to correct your ramps. Uh, we've seen several talks where people now correct for unispheric ramps, tight ramps. Um, so if you do that, you should have less long wavelengths. Uh, ramps. Sure. Um, not many ideas on the, yeah, I the think... residual ramps after that. Tim, you want to throw in there? Yeah, I tend to agree. I think I, I think the um. I was quite surprised by our long wavelength ramps in that they're they're quite they're quite consistent between neighboring tracks and so it's suggesting some systematic process. And I think ionosphere is probably the the most um likely one, at least uh, um yeah, because there are long long time long temporal long time period changes in the ionosphere that can then lead you to a systematic um bias because if it's just troposphere that's sometimes up and sometimes down why would you get a consistent pattern uh, but the ionosphere does change on a long temporal length scale so you need the 11 year spatial length scale <laughs> yeah yeah and, but there are, there are models and i think you know i think you know, we can uh, yeah. start to use those more systematically i think <laughs> Okay, so with that, okay. uh, I think we just conclude the session, uh, or this part of the session. We are only halfway through. There are two more earthquakes and tectonics parts, one after lunch and one tomorrow morning. I thank all the speakers, uh, especially for nice contributions for this part and uh, for people for listening and for posting questions. Let's take a lunch break and see you in an hour or so. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. See you.